Today we're going to be talking about the do's and don'ts of bowtie development. Welcome, my name is Will Fluck and this is the first of a number of interviews that we plan to hold with experts in their field from the oil and gas industry. Today we've got Chris Hamblin in. Chris is the co-author of the book uh, Hazards and Risk Management with the Aid of Bow Ties. He used to be the uh, regional head of technical safety for a major oil company and he's got 15 years in the uh, development and implementation of, of bow ties. Today we're going to be talking about the do's and don'ts associated with developing bow ties. Welcome Chris and thank you very much for coming in. Ah, oh, thanks for inviting me Will. You're, you're welcome and we're looking very much uh, forward to seeing what you've got to say about bow ties. Well, the bow tie process itself is well known in the industry today and the commercial software packages which are out there to draw bow ties are really useful tools to carry out qualitative risk assessment and involve the key people in the process. Um, but experience has shown that buying the software, um, <laughs> having a, a, a training program on how to use the software, okay, uh, probably doesn't cut it for turning out quality bow ties on your first attempt. And what we're going to talk about today is one or two tips, okay, that will help you produce better quality bow ties and ascend the learning curve a lot faster. What would you say in the, in the, in the first place? What, what, where, where should they start? What would the best thing that they could, uh, they could do? Well, I think the first thing which is important to me, and it's something which often isn't done, <clears throat> is that if you're going to use the bow tie process in your company, is to develop a bow tie protocol. And this is just a simple set of rules which says how you're going to build your bow ties. Um, it's a tremendous aid to consistency and to quality. Uh, in a number of cases, I've seen you know, major companies have created websites and put best practice bow ties on their websites. But to be honest, if these bow ties haven't been drawn or developed to the same protocol, okay, then they'll be inconsistent with each other and might uh, not be the aid that they're meant to be. So what, what do you advise when preparing a, a bow tie protocol? Well, the first two things are rather obvious really, but quite often cause problems. And the first one is make sure all your organization has the same version of the software. I've seen instances where bow ties have been exchanged between different organizations and they couldn't open them or they sent them back and the people who received them couldn't open them. So control the version of, shop, of software which is being used in your company so that the versions that are used are compatible with each other. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and secondly, um, technical vocabulary. You know, define your technical terms, your key technical terms, hazard, threat, top event, consequence, threat control, consequence, reducing measure, or whatever, whatever you call it, but define your key technical terms and stick with them. And this, if it's included in the protocol, will prevent people using something that sounds similar, okay, and creating a fuzziness to the bow ties instead of uh, a precision. Yeah, so really getting organised both with your versions and your terminology is, is, is key to, uh, is, is a key basic requirement. Well, those two cert certainly are because they're often overlooked. Okay, and also you need a good risk assessment matrix. Um, it's not necessary to introduce lots of numbers into the probability or consequence axes. And on the risk assessment matrix, you should mark the zone in which you see major accident hazards occurring. Uh, and for that reason, uh, you then know which ones to analyse, which hazards to analyse in detail later on. Secondly, a very big area and a newer area for bow tie software has been occupational safety and health, where bow ties are being drawn now. Okay, recognize that some commercial software is indeed geared for occupational safety and health, and as a result, not ideal in the terms of barrier categories, 
for major accident hazards. And you will need to modify the template before you start drawing your bow ties. That's a very good tip, I think, that. So what about other things uh, as part of the preparation, things like st uh, standard lists uh, of things? Uh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm, having tried it, I, I'm a great believer you should have a standard list of threats, a standard list of top events, and a standard list of consequences. And uh, what you say, why? Why do we need standard lists? Well, uh, to be honest, um, uh, if you don't, then people in your organisation will make their best guess about what to call the threat or what to call the consequence or the top mm -hmm. event. Uh, and I've seen cases where a particular threat on one bow tie was split into three, internal corrosion, external corrosion and erosion. On another bow tie of the same group was corrosion and erosion. And on another bow tie, probably done by someone else in, in, in the same team, it was corrosion and erosion as one threat. Now, the problem with that is you need consistency. And indeed, the first one, internal corrosion, external corrosion and erosion, would have been the best way to do it. Now, exactly the same thing applies to top events. OK, top events is loss of control, loss of containment, loss of integrity. It's not fires and explosions. OK, and, and lastly, consequences. Um, make sure they're well defined. And, um, you know, an unignited release of hydrocarbon gas is fine. But hydrocarbon release doesn't tell you very much about the consequence. So what about uh, how folk decide uh, what, what sort of detail that they, uh, that they should be uh, putting into their, into their barriers? Well, of course, um, most of the bow tie software uh, allows you to choose what you want to display, what will be contained within the bow tie software database, and, of course, what you decide to keep external. OK, and I think it's a very good idea to decide that up front mm -hmm. because otherwise you'll end up with bow ties which are too heavy with information, most of which isn't displayed, or things go the other way and you end up with a generic bow tie and everything external to it and no one can see the connection between the two. So um, what, what about the, uh, the, the numbering of, 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 of bow ties? I, I've actually seen some bow ties where uh, they, uh, they have a, a different number, the same barrier has a different number uh, on, on different bow ties. Yes, I mean that's the way I prefer to do it, but there is a school of thought that wants to give, uh, like a permanent to work barrier, if it occurs on six bow ties, they want to give it one number. Now, uh, that may work for bow tie display, although the number will be inconsistent with some of the other bow tie numbering, because second bow tie will be H2, third one will be H3, and so on. Okay, but uh, basically it works to give each barrier an individual number and then extract those barriers which are present in all the bow ties. For instance, if you've got permit to work six times and your permit to work system is in disarray, you know you have an increase in risk. One last point is yeah. uh, Bowtie software enables you to colour code barriers as to what type of barrier they are and what their effectiveness is. And it's well worth taking advantage of this. But everyone's got to use the same colours. So you <laughs> need to put that in your Bowtie protocol. Yes, I'm sure that's very important because colour coding is probably just as important as having the right definitions. No, I, th I think you're right. Um, because if bow ties aren't understood by the people you want to buy into them, they're, they're not going to influence thinking on risk very much. So that, that seems to be really good, uh, good information about, about what we should be doing in, in terms of developing your, your, your protocol. But when you're actually going to want to make better bow ties, do you have any, any uh, guidance or ideas on, on who should actually be involved in this process? Because sometimes it can be quite narrow. Well, there, there's some things that come up <coughs> frequently. I mean, the first thing is don't try and do the bow tie in your HSC department. Involve your drillers, involve your design engineers, if it's the design phase of a project. Um, involve your operations and your maintenance personnel. OK, because they know the detail which will prevent your bow tie from being a generic bow tie. I think that's the first point. Uh, you run the session a little bit like a hazard. Uh, they'll know the barriers, okay, 
and you get really good debate going, which is essential for good bow tie development. Also, we get problems with confusion between technical terms, which turn up as well. So that uh, again ties back to the importance of, of, of defining uh, everything. So uh, to uh, avoid uh, confusion, uh, well, what sort of examples are we talking about here? Well, that's why I talked earlier about technical vocabulary is well defined in your protocol. Mm -hmm. And the sort of um, confusion I see is has between hazards and threats. Uh, for instance, uh, hydrocarbon, gas or liquid under pressure is a hazard. But an earthquake or lightning is not a hazard, it's a threat. Mm. Okay? And uh, sometimes people get a bit confused by things like that. And also, um, top events often get confused with consequences. And people think the top event is fire, where actually it's loss of containment. Mm. The fire comes later if there's an ignition source. And uh, finally, I, I, I think one of uh, a common errors that I, I come across is confusion of major accident hazards, potential for major harm, but major ac accident events are actually the harm itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you need to be very clear because a major accident hazard is what you draw a bow tie for. Uh, a major accident event is something you'd expect to find on the right-hand side of a bow tie as a consequence. Incidentally, um, the use of bow ties in the occupational health area has spread uh, considerably over the last 10 years, and so you can't expect your bow tie to be, um, can, or your bow tie template to be configured for uh, um, major accident hazards. So uh, have a look at what the template shows and alter the barrier categories to suit the type of hazard that you are assessing with the bow tie. In the case of major accident hazards, that would be um, safety critical elements, HSE critical activities, um, design, etc. Uh, whereas for occupational safety and health, it will be a selection of permit to work or um, uh, engineering procedures, etc., etc. Yeah, a different yeah. different set of um, yeah. of information. What what uh, what would be sort of the key things for? For folk to remember, uh, uh, most important ab about um, when they want when they're trying to improve their their their, their bow ties. Uh, what would you well, say? Well, I think I think the first thing is don't overload yourself with information. Um, uh, you know, typically there's somewhere between six and twelve major accident hazards on a major project. Sometimes there's more, um, and. Uh, that's fine, and that'll generate an enormous amount of information when you draw the bow ties and extract the information from the mm -hmm. bow tie that you need. Um, if you took just the, la the larger of the remaining group of occupational safety and health hazards and drew bow ties for them, you could end up with 140 or so bow ties <laughs> for a given project. Which is uh, quite a considerable amount to, to, to manage and control. I That's say. absolutely right. And yeah. I, I would define this as information overload. So be selective. Yes, of course, use the bow tie process for the smaller hazards where you feel you need to. Mm -hmm. If the smaller hazards are well known and easily managed with occupational safety and health measures, then it's probably not necessary to draw a bow tie. Yeah, makes sense. One other confusion that occurs is where to put the barrier in the bow tie. Okay. And two common ones that end up in the wrong place are ignition control and detection. For some reason, because these, these seem very passive systems, they're seen as being on the left-hand side of the bow tie, preventative. But in actual fact, an ignition control system does nothing for your risks until something gets ignited. Mm -hmm. And the same thing uh, basically goes with detection. A detection system does nothing for your risk, certainly doesn't reduce the probability of a fire. Uh, what it basically does is tell you as quickly as possible you've got a fire. Yeah, and, and, and you have so an event. Yeah. It should be on the right hand side. Yeah. It should be on the right hand side. And, and lastly, re remember that bow ties. Uh, are basically maps of risk in the plant 
or the project that you're working on. And uh, they should match that plant or the, the project in terms of the hazards that the bow ties contain and their location in the plant itself. Um, and lastly, which is a very important one, and uh, I, I see a trend away from this today, and I don't think it's healthy, don't put all your bow ties out of house. Own them in-house. Yes, you may ask a consultant to help you draw them, but own them in-house and make sure your design people, if you're in feed or detailed design, own them, or your operations and maintenance people own them and can really relate to what's in them. Otherwise, they won't make much difference to the way you manage risk. Just, just on that point there, how, uh, you know, we, we, we talk about owning, uh, what about management and, and their, their, their role in terms of um, the implementation of, uh, of bow ties? I mean, is there an element of, of, of ownership for, for, for them as well? Well, yes, I, I, I think, to be honest, I, I, my comments were really aimed at management. Uh -huh. um, uh, if you see bow ties as a deliverable, push it out of house, get six or seven bow ties back, sign them off, put them on the shelf. Tick in a box. Uh, yeah. yeah, they're not going to do much for you in terms of managing risk. The bow tie is not an end in itself. Okay, It's a way of analysing hazards that will give you a list of safety critical elements, a list of HSE critical tasks. Um, it'll let you look at uh, cumulative risk across all your bow ties and it'll focus much more tightly on safety or HSE critical positions in the organisation organogram. So it's basically you know, key to you know, operating the, the, the installation. Uh, yes, safely. people know yeah. which barriers they're responsible for. Yeah, and, and it's a great way of communicating to uh, to everybody what, uh, what yes what that, the that's, and mitigations that's very true I, I remember recently doing some drilling bow ties and the uh, drilling team were having an audit and they did a good job on the bow ties and they used them to show the auditors how they were going to manage HSE uh, during the drilling activities and uh, they got uh, a good uh, for um, their pre operations rating whereas previously they'd always had an unsatisfactory. So it does show you bow ties can make a very positive contribution. Chris, thank you very much for coming in. Uh, contact details will follow of how, how you can get hold of Chris and also where you can purchase a copy of, uh, of this book, which is uh, published by Advisafe of, uh, of the Netherlands. Thank you very much.